Gretchen, stop trying to make fetch happen. <laughs> it's never going to happen. <laughs> oh, dear listeners. Welcome to the Mad Scientist Podcast, also known as the Stupid Science Bitch Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Stupid Coswell. Science Bitch Podcast. Here with my co-host, Marie Mayhew. Marie. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. How's you it going? You can't sit here. You cannot sit here. You cannot sit here. Oh, my God. On Wednesdays, we wear pink. All right. On Wednesdays, dear, we wear pink. Dear we listeners, uh, this episode, we're going to be talking about Silent Spring. Um, by Rachel Carson, we're going to be skidding our series on her. In this episode, we wanted to go through essentially the uh, the really the beginnings of the pesticide movement, the age of pesticides, as some of us or as, as some have come to call it. So, uh, Marie, are you ready? I am so ready for the pesticides. Cool. It's gonna I be for- fetch. I. It's going to be so fetch. It's so fetch. All right, Jake, roll a tape. There was once a town in the heart of America where all life seemed to live in harmony with its surroundings. The town lay in the middle of a checkerboard of prosperous farms with fields of grain and hillsides of orchards where in spring, white clouds of bloom drifted above the green fields. In autumn, oak and maple and birch set up a blaze of color that flamed and flickered across a backdrop of pines. Then foxes barked in the hills and deer silently crossed the fields, half hidden in the mist of the fall mornings. Along the roads, laurel, vibranium, and alder, great ferns and wildflowers, delighted the traveler's eye through much of the year. Even in winter, the roadsides were places of beauty, where countless birds came to feed on the berries and on the seed heads of the dried weeds rising above the snow. The countryside was, in fact, famous for the abundance and variety of its bird life, and when the flood of migrants was pouring through in spring and fall, people traveled from great distances to observe them. Others came to fish the streams, which flowed clear and cold out of the hills, and contained shady pools where trout lay. So it had been from the days many years ago when the first settlers raised their houses, sank their wells, and built their barns. Then a strange blight crept over the area, and everything began to change. Some evil spell had settled on the community. Mysterious maladies swept the flocks of chickens. The cattle and sheep sickened and died. Everywhere was a shadow of death. The farmers spoke of much illness among their families. In the town, the doctors had become more and more puzzled by new kinds of sickness appearing among their patients. There had been several sudden and unexplained deaths, not only among adults, but even among children, who would be stricken suddenly while at play and die within a few hours. There was a strange stillness. The birds, for example, where had they gone? Many people spoke of them, puzzled and disturbed. The feeding stations in the backyards were deserted. The few birds seen anywhere were morbid. They trembled violently and could not fly. It was a spring without voices. On the mornings that had once throbbed with a dawn chorus of robins, catbirds, doves, jays, wrens, and scores of other birds' voices, there was now no sound. Only silence lay over the fields and woods and marsh. On the farms, the hens brooded, but no chicks hatched. The farmers complained that they were unable to raise any pigs. The litters were small, and the young survived only a few days. The apple trees were coming into bloom, but no bees droned among the blossoms so there was no pollination and there would be no fruit. The roadsides, once so attractive, were now lined with brown and withered vegetation as though swept by fire. These, too, were silent, deserted by all living things. Even the streams were now lifeless. Anglers no longer visited them, for all the fish had died. In the gutters, under the eaves and between the shingles of the roofs, a white granular powder still showed a few patches. Some weeks before it had fallen like snow upon the roofs and the lawns, the fields and streams. No witchcraft, no enemy action had silenced the rebirth of new life in this stricken world. The people had done it to themselves. End quote. That's how she starts Silent Spring. Nowhere to go but up. (laughs) Rachel Carson is a badass. She kind of is. She kind of is. Especially for when that was written. If that was written today, that would be, you know, de rigueur, right? I think that that would be, you know... Not even given a second glance, but the fact that it was written in, what was the year it was written in? Like, I want to say 1973, seven, before that. 1962 was originally published. 1962. 19, I mean, 1962. Yeah, it's. Is amazing. It's wild. So for those that don't know, 
Rachel Carson is uh, was a scientist who was responsible for the creation of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States. She was one of the major – so she was a major voice in science communication. It's a little bit – it's a little bit inaccurate to categorize categorize her as a scientist, perhaps. Um, she got it, the definition of who is and isn't a scientist or who can be considered working in the sciences and things. That's a pretty muddy question, generally. I'd mm-hmm. say that Rachel Carson was a journalist who specialized in science journalism and did so specifically um, through uh, various government agencies. So she was a scientist. She did. She was a working scientist for a time period. She studied as a scientist. Um, you know, so really, uh, I would consider her to be a scientist for sure. However, you know, uh, her what she's mostly known for is her journalistic work, where she talked about and wrote about the natural world, and eventually would come to write about and be most well known for her work, Silent Spring, which discussed the disastrous effects of pesticides um, on the natural world, essentially. So uh, this episode, we're going to talk about pesticides just to begin with kind of the history of the, of the field itself. So uh, first off the food and agricultural organization, which is a UN body, they describe pesticides as any substance or mixture of substances intended for preventing, destroying or controlling any pest. So a pesticide is kind of a catch all phrase. It means an insecticide, so something used to kill insects, a fungicide, <laughs> a all kinds of things, right? Um, mm-hmm. Anything, right? Mm-hmm. It stops the growth of plants. It will, uh, you know, dry out f- plants or animals or, or insects. It will kill bacteria. It will whatever, you know. It can take any kind of chemical form too, right? Exactly, I mean, yeah. Just a spray. It can be pellets. It can be whatever. Yeah, it it, liter- it literally means anything. Anything that can really control or hurt the population of a certain species. Mm-hmm. So the uh, generally pesticides are targeted, like Marie said, they're defined by either their method of application, their target organism. So again, we have insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, uh, you know, weed killers, whatever, or by uh, by the actual chemical structure of the pesticide itself or the way that it's been generated. So, for instance, we often have a distinction between, say, an organic pesticide versus an inorganic pesticide. And what that would mean is chemically something that's made up of primarily hydrocarbons, so hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, those kinds of compounds, versus something that contains an inorganic species, which would be really anything except for carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So, um, you know, things that, for instance, contain, you know, phosphate and nitrogen are also considered organic compounds. But, you know, so mm-hmm. things like arsenic. Arsenic would be an inorganic pesticide. Um, another one would be the difference between a synthetic versus a biological pesticide. So a synthetic pesticide would be one that we generate inside of a laboratory or we obtain from an from a quote unquote unnatural source. Again, remembering that chemistry is completely natural. You know, it's it is all it, the natural world, but not found in nature exactly. as an and, absolute. Yeah. Right. And that's the distinction, right? It's not found in mm-hmm. nature necessarily. So, again, we can make the distinction. It's not like peppermint oil. Peppermint right. oil would be a natural pesticide. Yeah, a biological pesticide. Yes, Absolutely. Biological. Right. Yes. But so some of these things are – and again, though, natural here does not mean anything – Natural here good. is yeah, it does not mean good. You know, arsenic is a natural pesticide, but it is extremely poisonous. So you know, it's it's yes. um, it, there's it's a very natural. There. It's all oh, natural, all natural, Marie. Completely uh, organic and good for you. Another <laughs> another way that's used to kind of classify pesticides is by their chemical makeup. So, Marie, hmm, what do you think the four major? Cl- what do you think the four classifications of synthetic pesticides are? Uh, <laughs> pop quiz, Louise, man. Pop, pop quiz, Marie. Pop quiz. Well, you already went through kind of how they would break out, like as herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, right, and garden yes. pesticides, yeah. right. So this, so this, okay. So this has to do with their chemical makeup. Oh well, God, no! I, I don't stand a chance. All okay, right. all right, Marie. <laughs> Let's do this. So we have the. So one thing I want listeners at home to do, 
is I actually want you to open up a periodic table. Not if you're driving. If you're driving, drive your car. For just like a split second, I was so sure you were going to say, I want you to get out some insecticide. And I was going to be like, whoa, 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 dude, dude. <laughs> Slow your roll. <laughs> I want you to go find some Roundup. All right. I want you to spray this on your face. You're going to notice a different smell than what you're smelling normally. I want you to look Let's at spray a- this one on your face. Do you see the yeah. difference? All right, right. Uh, I want you to look. I want you to look at a periodic table. Yes. Much okay. safer. It is much safer. natural. Now, Still here's natural. The- Here's the thing, right? Okay, Marie, I want you to open a periodic table, huh. too. Uh, we're, we're doing this okay. experiment together, friends. Here we go. Listen, I'm opening it. There we go. It's open. Okay, great. Okay. So, if you look at the periodic table, you will notice that it is broken up into uh, groups and then broken up into periods. Mm-hmm. The groups are the columns. Mm-hmm. Okay? So, so the, the groups, rather, they start at the top and then they go down the periodic table but each kind of drop over to the right one or left one is a difference in the group number. Okay. Yes. The period is going to be the row of the periodic table itself. So for instance, if you're looking at a periodic table, group one, period one is hydrogen and group. uh, What's it? uh, Group uh, 18 period one is helium. Make sense. Yes. Yes, it does. I'm trying to find one. Okay, great. All right. (laughs) Now here's the thing. On either side, either extreme side of the periodic table, you get the you get more and more reactive species. All right. So on the left hand side, you get reactive metals and on the right hand side, you get reactive nonmetals. Now, on the right hand side, we get it. We actually have a row or a column that is completely unreactive known as the noble known as the noble gases, the noble gases. Yes. Yep. So those it are was like a Jeopardy question. Yeah. So that's like helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, John, those ones xenon, on the far and, right. Yeah. The column to the left of the noble gases, just to the left. Uh-huh. Those are known as the halogens. Those are compounds that are extremely reactive. So things like fluorine, mm-hmm. chlorine, bromine, and iodine, those are all very, very reactive. All right. And then the mm-hmm. farther left you get, the farther towards the middle, the less sort of kind of the less reactive things get. It's not really a hundred percent true, but for instance, gold, uh, you know, chemical element 79 mm-hmm is extremely unreactive and that kind of sits, you know, smack dab in the middle, right? With copper and silver on top of it. Right. So A-U. anyways, so uh, the chemicals that we're talking about here, they're mostly going to be from um, what's the word from the, uh, the halogen class here that are extremely deadly. Now the first class of pesticides, synthetic pesticides, major classifications are the organochlorines. So these contain chemical elements, 17 chlorine inside of them. Those are things like, say, DDT, Toxaphene, Dieldrin, Aldrin. We're going to talk about those a lot in this series. These are the main ones that Rachel Carson was working against. These these chemicals, what they do, they have a bunch of. So anytime we talk about a chemical that's toxic or, you know, a pesticide, anything that has some kind of effect on the body, we talk often about an area of effect or a target organ or target organ system. What that really means is where in the body is this thing going to hit you? All right. Mm-hmm. So we're going to, we're going to play a little game here, Marie. Mm-hmm. I want you to guess, where do you think organic, chlor- where do you think organochlorines will attack the body? The lungs. The lungs. Yeah. It's a su- That's a super good guess because chlorine will mess up your lungs like in mustard gas. Right. Mm-hmm. The organo is, that is mustard gas, right? It is. Chlorine is in mustard gas. The organochlorines okay. actually they're oh, wait, mostly it's like nerve. It's a nerve thing. It's an, it's a nervous thing, but it's also a reproductive thing. The organochlorines are particularly <sighs> known and became famous during Rachel Carson's time because so we thought that just by spraying them on bugs, it would just, you know, it would kill the bugs off and then animals wouldn't be affected. But what we didn't study before applying it was how it would affect the reproductive organs of animals. And so what it turned out to do was it led to, for instance, uh, entire populations of bird species going uh, extinct in certain areas because they could not reproduce anymore because the chlorine and or the organochlorines were so damaging to their reproductive system. Um, The next major class of pesticides are the organophosphates. 
Now, phosphorus is chemical, uh, chemical 15, so it's in the same row as chlorine, but it is much less reactive. The reason that phosphorus is so dangerous is because it's such a readily taken up chemical in the body. Phosphorus and phosphorus compounds, um, organophosphates, are very common. Uh, they are, uh, you know, your DNA has phosphorus groups on it that help to to bridge and build things. A lot of chemical structures in the body contain phosphorus, so uh, phosphorus-containing compounds tend to be easily digestible or taken in. Um, so these ones, Marie, are known as diazinone, glyphosate, and malathion. Glyphosate being the most common current one that gets people all up in a tizzy, right? Marie, give me a guess. Organophosphates, right, yes. where do you think they affect? Organophosphates. Um... Ah, probably again, like I keep going back to like, it's gotta be like the nervous system, your lungs, like ding, 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 what ding, would ding. kill you first. Central right? nervous yeah. system. Central nervous system. I mean, I would assume again, like eventually you will be, your population will be killed out from reproductive, from not being able to reproduce. But like the first thing that one of these things would do to eliminate anything is take out your central nervous system, just yeah. basically shut you down. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. My, my guess. Yeah. You're killing well, it, Marie. You're doing great. I'm killing. I'm like phosphorus. <laughs> like phosphorus. I'm so fetch. So okay. So the next two, uh, the next two are, I'm glad we have such a, such a good sense of humor about this. Cause really? it's just, just really awful. It's awful. really, I was going to say like the liver too, like the, the half life of this stuff living in your body, even if you get, well, I'm jumping ahead. Go oh, ahead. we're going to get into that. Yeah. So the next, the next class is called the carbamates, uh, which contain things like carbofuran, aldicarb and carbaryl. Again, those affect the central nervous system. Those aren't the, the, this one. And then the next one, pyrethroids, they're not that important for the Rachel Carson story, mostly because they were invented or, or they were really started to be used after silent spring came out. So a lot of mm-hmm. a lot of the history of pesticides in the modern age, which Marie is going to touch on and, and did a lot of good research on here for this episode, um, a lot of the modern switch after Silent Spring came out was, I mean, first off, we learned none of the lessons of Silent Spring, <laughs> but uh, oh. even worse than that, we you know we didn't we didn't really get any better at at understanding what we had to do with these things, or or rather, what we shouldn't do to the natural world. Instead, we just kind of we just kind of developed other types of organic or, or uh, synthetic chemicals that could be utilized in this way without really yeah. again. It just made it harder to understand what it's actually going to do. to. Yeah. So we went we went from the organochlorines where it was like very obvious what they were doing because there were dead birds on the side of the road and stuff to the organophosphates where the some of the damage seems to be more long term, more. Uh, more subtle, but not any less deadly or, or less uh, destructive. Um, the pyrethroids are a particularly interesting class of pesticide. Um, these are containing compounds like uh, uh delta methrin, and then cypermethrin. I don't know why I'm, I'm listing off the names of some of these other ones, because it's like everyone knows what glyphosate is at this point. People should know what DDT, Dieldrin, and Aldrin were. Those are the ones from Silent Spring. But these new ones, I mean, you know, just don't buy them in the store, I guess, if you're at Walmart. But uh, pyrethroids are particularly interesting because actually, so pyrethroids are, they were first discovered by scientists at Romstead in the the 1960s. And actually what they do, or what they are, are they are organic compounds that were created by altering pyrethrins, which are actually a natural toxin that comes from chrysanthemums. Hmm. So uh, chrysanthemums were, uh, were a, very common pesticide to be used before we had chemistry. Really. Um, we knew that chrysanthemums could be ground up and the compound itself would kill, you know, uh, kill plants. We didn't want or kill, uh, insects and things. Uh, however, what pyrethrins do Marie, it's pretty terrifying. So when your nerves, when your body, you know, when your brain tells your nerves to act, what happens is you have these voltage, we have these voltage gated sodium channels inside of our axonal membranes and our nerves. And so what happens is you're kind of like the voltage turns on and then it turns off. So it polarizes and depolarizes. And mm-hmm. that's how, that's how signal gets down like through your nerves to things, right? What this thing yes. does is it freaks out those voltage uh, gated sodium channels so badly that they never close. Oh God. 
So you just you just become paralyzed, and so your brain just like is like I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, and you just suffocate. My God, craziness, right? So it doesn't even yeah, it's like it its effect on the central nervous system is even more insidious in that it doesn't just shut it down. It over, it overstimulates it. Exactly. Yeah. It's nuts. That's right. Wrong. That's wrong. All this stuff is just like researching this. I was just like, really, man, really? it's a, it's a tough, uh, it's oh. a tough, uh, it's a tough one, Marie. Um, <laughs> it's a tough one. Anyways, so yes. All right. So that's kind of the general view of where pesticides are at this point in time. Let's say, you know, not, you know, not exactly, but so we have our four major classes of synthetic pesticides. We still use uh, natural or organic or biological pesticides as well. Again, things like arsenic, like sulfur, um, you know, all kinds of different things. The history of pesticides really, uh, really begins at about the beginning of human civilization, right? When we started farming, you know, we have evidence that compounds like sulfur were used back by the ancient uh, Sumerians. You know, um, they knew that adding sulfur or adding salt to a field uh, could stop things growing, right? Or could kill uh, bugs specifically or fungus on contact. So they knew enough to see that some compounds added to the fields could actually help them protect things. However, a lot of the times what ended up happening was humans just got super lucky that the plants we needed had natural predator prey relationships that kept pests at bay, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Mm -hmm. a good example of this would be, you know, you have, uh, I don't know, you have corn, you're growing corn or something, and there are crows that come and eat the bugs off the corn. That is a natural, or, or rather, you know, there's a ladybug that comes and eats the aphids from the plant and that kills them off. And so then you don't have mites and things infesting the plants themselves. Right. right? Or you have a cat and the cat keeps. Right. Keeps the mice away. Mice away from the grain. Right. It's just kind of a natural, like a symbiotic kind of relationship that happened where humans were lucky enough to need this plant that already had another animal controlling the pests on it. When we started using pesticides, though, what we started doing really was playing with the natural balance there. So, you know, Mm -hmm. you kill off the ladybugs because you think they're a pest and you think they're eating your plants or something. And then suddenly you have a blight on your plants because the aphids have taken over right, or the mites have come back or something. And then you have to kill them off with something else. Right. It's, it's, right. It's like, it's right. like that never, it's like that, that Simpsons episode where they have the snake, the snake day or whatever. Exactly. Snake right. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, but that's actually what it's called. It's the pesticide treadmill. Yes. Right? Is that you just keep having to one up your game on pesticides to solve whatever problem you've created instead of not tinkering with what you tinkering with the science that's ultimately going to destroy everything. Right. And we're, and we're going to talk about how some of those like messes with predator prey relationships went out of whack. Cause Rachel Carson, there was a lot of stuff she was right on, but that's one thing she was super wrong on in my opinion, but we'll, oh, really? we'll, get, yeah. we'll get into it anyways. So um, the next, the really the next big shift over, in the use of pesticides was the use of metals or chemicals that we were able to now extract uh, and purify in certain ways. So the 15th century, we see um, ancient China, we see Chinese alchemists developing things like say arsenic, lead or mercury purified compounds that they found could be used to kill mites or protect plants, Um, which is really interesting. However, what the Chinese didn't realize at the time until it became too late and they had to kill an emperor was that ingesting these compounds could make you crazy uh, or, you know, or could really like hurt your population and be worse again than the pests themselves. Yes. Um, so a- another compound that was used, which is kind of interesting was smoke, you know? So uh, smoke was used as a means of controlling insects and blights on plants, uh, Essentially because we thought during the Middle Ages, especially in the West, that if something had a bad smell, it must be bad for you or it must be, you know, it must be dangerous because it has a bad smell, which is Mm -hmm. oftentimes a good rule of thumb, except for in chemistry, where it's actually at either side of things. If, Uh if If you can smell it at all, it's really bad for you, probably. 
Um, so, for instance, you know, but there's stuff that doesn't. It has no scent, and it's going to kill you. Just well, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, like in chemistry, the rule is you should not be breathing. You should not be making chemicals outside of a lab hood, anyways. So, you know, like you should not be smelling chemicals at all. But if you smell a, you know, I used to tell my students if they smelled a sweet smell, uh, that meant get out of the lab as quickly as you could. You know, because that meant that one oh, of your that meant yep. that one of your uh, organo metallics um, was was loose in the lab somehow, or something got out of a hood, right? So it was safer to evacuate and come get me, and I could deal with it. Um, Can we get you? You down? What you're in the teachers' lounge having an espresso? Yeah, having a smoke kicking and back. You know, yeah, having just a having smoking a, espresso, having a criminal like time, right? The kids are just setting fire so, to themselves uh, in the lab. <laughs> So uh, over time, though, our knowledge of pesticides really basically stayed about that level where we thought, you know, we'll smoke these other compounds could help, whatever. We really didn't have a lot of good ways. One of the most effective ways, actually, which is really interesting, was the use of dried daisies to protect against head lice, um, which was actually brought back to Europe from the Crusades. It was something that we pulled in then. And then, of course, the use of chrysanthemums, which we talked about before, um, which was one of our most early uses of pest control. It wasn't really until the age of the really the age of chemicals and chemical industry that we get the first big synthetic. uh, What's the word? The first big synthetic chemicals. And so we really start to be able to use or, you know, learn about these pesticides. And one of the most important figures in that is Paul Herman Mueller. Um, who is a Swiss chemist who actually won the Nobel Prize in 1948. And uh, Marie, do you want to know what he, you want to guess what he won the Nobel Prize for? Oh, this was another Jeopardy question. Paul got this one right. And I was like, what? Uh, I give up. I don't know. He discovered DDT. Ah, one of the most DDT is a that. DDT is a fascinating chemical. It is, it is yeah. simultaneously one of the most uh, it's a chemical that has probably saved more human lives than yeah. almost any other, but has led to the death of almost more animals and, and birds and fish and <laughs> insects. Yes. It's a yes. fascinating, fascinating story. So I just wanted to quickly, before we get into the modern stuff, talk a little bit about Mueller himself, um, which is super interesting. So he actually, he was born in uh, 1899 in Olten Solothurn, which was, um, What's the word in uh, in Switzerland? His uh, initially he just became a chemist. Like he went to high school and then started being a lab assistant for this chemical company, and he liked it so much that they let him. Uh, they 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 had him go on to get his PhD, which yeah. is super crazy. So his PhD was on the chemical and electrochemical oxidation of asymmetrical M xylidine and its mono and dimethyl derivatives, which he got in 1925, and um. He then got a job with a J.R. Gigi AG in Basel, Switzerland, which initially he was working on the creation of dyes and natural tanning agents. However, at a certain point, they asked him to uh, develop an insecticide. And so what's really interesting was that uh, at, during that time period, the only the only real insecticides we had were either super expensive or they were really ineffective. And the reason that they were ineffective was because the you know the better they got, the more they were uh, capable of killing humans as well. Mm-hmm. So it essentially became kind of a trade off, right? Like, do you want arsenic in your in your wheat, or do you want bugs? I'd rather take the bugs, right? They're crunchy. Protein. They're a little bit crunchy. Yes. Uh, so what's really funny is he discusses how he wanted to quote synthesize the ideal contact insecticide one which would have a quick and powerful toxic effect upon the largest possible number of insects while causing little or no harm to plant and warm blooded animals. Um, he, he, he specifically discusses how he got into science because he loved nature because he loved, you know, he wanted to make an insecticide mm-hmm. that would let him, uh, what's the word, you know, that would allow him to, fix all these problems he was seeing in the world at the time. So, you know, this so was right to hell. Right? Well, so th- this was interesting, right? This was right around the time of these major epidemics that were going around. So for instance, in 1935, there was, uh, there was a huge typhus epi- epidemic in Russia. 
which led to uh, led to massive deaths. There were, you know, in, intense problems with typhus and malaria. Um, on, on top of that, in his own country of Switzerland, there were uh, these food shortages that were caused by crops being killed off by insects. Um, there were all of these problems, right? And so yes. what he found was uh, he wanted to find a chemical that would, he thought, only kill insects on contact but do no harm to anything else. And the chemical he found was known as dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane or DDT, um, which was originally discovered by a, a pharmacologist named Ahmed Ziedler in 1874. Although Ziedler didn't, you know, sprinkle it on any bugs or anything and realize that it could kill them on contact. Um, and really that is the, that's the beginning of the pesticide age. Mueller discovers DDT um, he actually uses it to um, – what's the word? He actually it ends up being used to save uh, millions of lives in World War II. Um, it helps to yeah. eradicate malaria, yeah. Um, yeah. In, including in the United yeah. States. That is how it – that is how it uh, – what's the, what's the word? That is how it That's actually how was eradicated, eradicated it. Yeah. in the United extinct. States. Yep. Or was, yeah. Um, you know, he – again, he saved probably more lives than almost any other human, you know – in history uh, with his invention and yet, or with his discovery, he didn't invent DDT, but he found um, it's, it's efficacy here, but again, yeah, best use, but again, likely did so at a cost of extreme damage to the natural world. Um, and, you know, which, which in some ways we have actually been able to ameliorate somewhat in the modern day, but you know, um, every day we get rid of kind of a, an EPA rule or, you know, um, Mm -hmm. It just gets worse mm -hmm. and worse. So anyways, so Marie, that leaves us with the modern day pesticides. So well, yeah, uh, and I think if there's some, something to be said about the use of DDT in some cases in like sub-Saharan Africa, you know, the world health organization reports back as recently as the year 2000, that it malaria is still one of the most deadliest diseases out there. It will kill uh, in one year, each year it killed over 880,000 people, mostly children in sub-Saharan Africa. So, you know, in trying to balance how do you, how do you stop this, but then how do you not let this chemical run rampant and cause further damage? What, you know, what is, what's the balance and what's the trade-off? So I think what's interesting is there still, there still might be, I don't want to say an argument about pro of it but it's like it's it's sort of one of the last resorts in combating malaria which is still you know plaguing certain areas well it's an interesting it's you kind know? of an it's kind of an interesting test case because i think we want to know or i think we want to what's the word like i think we i think humans believe that we can change the environment and just get away with it <laughs> you know, like we can, we can launch. Yes. Well, you know, like, yeah, we're, yes. we kind yes. of assume yes. that, you know, we push our way through the natural world or the natural world will just kind of coalesce around us in the way that we want, yes. it, want it to. And things will basically be undisturbed, but that's not the way it works. You know, everything has a knock on effect. So yeah, I mean, yeah, in sub-Saharan Africa or in areas, let's put it this way, in areas where the threat of malaria is so great that, yeah. You know that that that's it. Either you get rid of malaria, or you you know you let it decimate populations. It seems like a no brainer to apply DDT in yeah. a certain well, way. Also, to because it's a, it's inexpensive and highly effective, right? So it's not. You could come up with a more um, targeted method. Yeah, I mean, you could you know shoot these things down with lasers for all I care. But I mean, it, which would be great, but. At the same time, it's like, what is the practicality and how do you implement something and how expensive is that Right, it'd be, for it'd be, the area yeah. you're going into? Especially for like the World Health Organization, it has, you know, again, there's not a lot of money being put towards something like this. So how do you balance those risks and how do you figure out what the long-term effect is? And I think it's it's interesting because it still keeps coming up, right? It's it's Frankenstein's monster. It doesn't, it hasn't it hasn't subsided or gone away or been replaced by anything else. 
No, and well, that's been the, as effective, right? The Just other interesting, the other interesting thing too with this is, I mm-hmm. think the overall discussion behind kind of the we we were allowed to wreck our environment for 150 <laughs> years, <laughs> and yep. you know we were allowed to do whatever we wanted and run, you know, run right over as many you know species and ecosystems yes. and organisms and niches and whatever that we wanted and. Now we are going to tell other countries that that don't have the luxury of worrying about, well, my roadside isn't pretty anymore. Right. You know, in, in some ways, the argument that Rachel Carson makes is an argument from extreme privilege of, well, I yeah. like bird watching, and I like that my roadside is beautiful. And I like, you know, and, and there is some argument I think to be made, and this is going to be part of her argument that we as humans have – she was a religious person or at least was raised religiously. Mm-hmm. And so in, in her mind and in the mind of many naturalists at the time and, and biologists and zoologists, the one of the arguments to be made for why we should protect the land was that God made us natural stewards of it. You know, God gave Adam and Eve the responsibility to watch over all the living creatures of the earth. And so there's an argument that we, we are, have a responsibility to be careful and to make sure that these animals have a place to live and their habitat and everything else. But that is a really easy argument to make when you're not starving to death. It's a lot, yes. it's a lot harder to make that argument when you're, yeah. you know, when your kid is dying of malaria because of a, a yeah. bug that was killed off in another society. Right. I think that that's, you know, privilege affords you that, yeah. that sort that perspective. But we're also not helping. We're not giving money. We're not solving. We're not solving any of the other problems. If if, if anything, to your point, we created, we created this monster. We you know sprayed it on everything and basically you know safeguarded ourselves. And then it was like, oh, this is bad. We should stop. But we've ignored everywhere else in the world where it's still a problem and haven't given them any sort of option or haven't given them any sort of funding to help them to help them eradicate it for themselves instead, sure. you know, instead of saying it's like, Oh, it's deadly. It's poisonous. Well, you know, so it's like, so to your point is, so is dying of malaria, which is <laughs> sounds like after AIDS, it is the second biggest killer. Yeah. I mean, it's not like it's, it's horrendous. Anyways, huzzah. Um, uh, so I, the thing that fascinated me about all of this and sort of the advent of pesticides is, how do you take how do you take something like this that, that is a necessity and what happens when it starts to become a commodity and you start to make money off of it which is the next sort of the next evolution with anything it's like it's a necess- having crops ha- being able to grow food being able to eliminate threats to that food having that food in turn feed other things that you eat is a huge opportunity for companies. How do we make, how do we always end up at the proletariat that should seize the means of production? (laughs) How do we always, I don't know, dude, I try, I trust every episode hard not to, Okay, but, so but it's but it, it's really self evident. I mean, so the let me, first let me, things, one of the things that you get into and you start looking at this. Go ahead, go ahead. Let me yes. let me rephrase. Let me rephrase your point first. Yes, because mm-hmm. so okay, what you're saying is it's a really interesting concept to think that. First off, j- getting rid of the idea that you could own something like a plant that naturally oh, we haven't even grows, gotten to that. You know, yeah, we right. haven't even gotten to the ownership right. of the ownership of said plant, the genetics of said plant, right, We're or saying, the land hey, or whatever. Hey, farmer, I'm looking at I'm looking at that land. It would be a, it would be a cry and shame if something happened to that, right? It's sort of it's almost right. I, right. I, I don't we, mean to make it sound so exploitive, but it's like it's it is an industry that is a necessity. No, what, so what you find, yeah, yeah what you're what you're talking about is like, for instance. The guy that discovered this guy, Mueller, that discovers DDT, does his company have a responsibility to other people to make it cheaply no. and freely, you know, maybe not freely available? Well, do they have a responsibility to understand um, to understand its long term effects? 
to to self-regulate themselves in its distribution. Oh, do they have okay. do they have a responsibility to be good stewards okay. with this with this um with this property because that's basically DDT was now was now trademarked. It was now it was now a patent. It belongs mm. to a company and it's a necessity to help eradicate malaria in so and and but same for any kind of pesticide, right? So all of these pesticides that we're talking about, like herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, things that are used for crops, mm. uh, home and garden pesticides, all of these, all of these uh, chemicals and chemical compounds are a necessity to grow our food in some regards, right? At this point, with farming. Um, you have to have some sort of pesticide. You've already started to spray your your crops. You've already invested in, you know, in growing something. You have to have it succeed because sure. you have to pull that harvest, sell it, and then replant. So you can't have something kill it. And not only that, but your your the thing that you're growing, corn, grain, whatever, is ultimately could be fed to chicken or to cattle that will ultimately be butchered and sold as more food. So the idea that pesticides, you know, kind of came from, uh, you know, this one-off, a more simple opportunity, they quickly, like my research, it's like, again, to your point, it was like, ah, oh, man, here we go again, big, you know, big pharma. But it's, it's true. There's four different companies uh, in the modern day, like so as of today, that basically have the market capitalized for uh, for agrochemicals, which is um, insecticides, fungicides, okay. all of these things. So there's four big ones, and they they own the market. And who, and who are the big ones? The big ones are Syngenta. Like Syngenta? So Syngenta. The, the beautiful thing about this is you've heard of some of them, and you haven't heard of others. Right. Right? So this isn't, again, this isn't like nickel and dime stuff. Syngenta is a Swiss company. They're traded on the stock market. They are, they have a market capitalization of about $41 billion. Ooh. Right? So, and they, de they develop herbicides, fungicides, okay. all of this good stuff. They are like the largest producers of pesticides in the world. Oh, wow. Okay. I, you know, I they, had never so heard they of off, them. They also... Um, so in 2015, they rejected an acquisition offer from Monsanto, which should sound familiar to some of our listeners. Yeah, you know, we'll go into we'll go into Monsanto and and it's how beautiful that is. And that was valued, but Monsanto was going to buy them for 47 billion. Wow! But they said, you know what, that offer's too low. You know, we've we've looked at our own internal estimates, and we think that our our um our value is going to be closer to like sixty two billion dollars, uh, but right, but about a year later, Syngenta agreed to be purchased by a company called ChemChina, okay, for forty three billion in cash. <laughs> so that is not, not suspicious at all. So. <laughs> This is just the this is just one of the four, right? So there's there's the big four. So Syngenta is like again this Swiss conglomerate that's now uh, held by ChemChina, who bought them for forty three billion with a B in 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 cash. So no, you know, no like hey, I'll pay you, I'll gladly pay you tomorrow for a hamburger today. They put all the money down, which is mind boggling. Uh, so the next next big player is Bayer AG. Yep, and Bayer is. Uh, based out of Germany, they are a company that should be very. They should be very familiar to all of us. Their do healthcare. They, do, do they make glyphosate? Is that the one that they make or Roundup? I think they're the ones that oh, make Roundup. Oh, 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 oh no, no, I don't think so. I don't. I um. I don't think that that's them. Hold, wait, hold, yeah, wait, ah, just hold on. Just hold on. We'll get yeah, into yeah, it. We'll yeah, get yeah, into yeah. Round. Round, yeah, Roundup is Bayer. Yep, it's Bayer. Bayer. Okay. So it's under Bayer a different. AG, it's, but, it's under a different name, but yeah, it's under. It's Bayer. It's their company. But this is so. This is the same company that sells healthcare products. So yes. they sell, um, they sell. You know, again, all of the all of or good portion of 
I'm trying to think of the word, the contrast that is used and injected into your body when you're going in for an MR. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Going in for a CT. I think it's I think it's Uh, called just contrasting agent, isn't it? Or just dye? Contrast, yes, contrasting agent, yes, imaging contrasting agent. So they 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 again they and but they they sell they sell a huge amount of other things, but they are huge in this industry as well. Uh, They were valued at approximately 120 billion. Um, they Jeez. merged. So Dupau, the, uh, the Dow, uh, chemical company and DuPont, oh. uh, agreed to a merger in December of 2015. Uh-huh. They were valued the two companies together, 120 billion, uh-huh. uh, shareholders, of course, agreed this agreed to the merger in, in uh, 2016 and the, the cumulative pesticide revenue of Dow DuPont in DuPont. 2007, Dow DuPont, DuPont. Seven, yeah, DuPont, no, Dow no, no, DuPont, no worries. Uh, in 2017 exceeds 14, uh, 14 and a half billion dollars. Man, so this is this is just a yeah. So this it's is, a this crazy, is not, it's a crazy economical. Yeah, so it's a I mean, powerhouse, and it's like it's like, and these companies, the thing too is, it's like they they're they're purchasing, they're selling off little portions of their own companies, and the other companies mm-hmm. buy them. So it's sort of like the socks going around in the washers, how I kind of look at it. Is they'll sell off some, one of their agro science companies, sure, yeah. and then somebody else will pick it up, and then they'll split it again. And so they keep testing, and they keep creating new R&D as yep. well. And so, and they, But even more insidious than any kind of R&D is their marketing, right? Because their marketing arm is, is, a huge, is a huge reason why, one, you don't know these companies – Two, sure. you feel comfortable using using their stuff on their lawn. Well, uh, yeah, um, that's yeah. The, that's the part of this I think is interesting, right? And so I think the other the other one of those big ones is BASF, right? Yes. Okay. Dude, oh wait, dude. Sorry, dude. I'm only on number two. We're, we're still in the billions. BASF out of Germany, market cap of sixty billion, offers pesticides through one of its divisions, uh, but it's one of five separate chemical segments in the company. Okay. Um. Primarily aimed at consumer users, right? So yeah. the other ones may be more, more uh, commercial like farming. Based. These, R- sure. Yes. So this is this is all this is all your mom and pop stuff for your back from your backyard, and their sales in, for just cons- uh, just commercial use in 2017, 1633 billion uh, pounds, or well, sorry, uh, no euro. Okay, yeah, euro. euro so, okay. Yes. Okay. So so, so like, far. Jeez. So so far we have Synergista, which was forty billion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What was the second one? Uh Bayer, which was at like fifty or sixty. Yes. BASF is around sixty as well. Yes. Woo. And okay. Then, yes. So I mean basically this is huge amount of money. And it's it it's I can't even wrap my head around sort of the amount of cash that's, that's being, uh, you know, traded for this and for these for these companies. It is it's pretty staggering. And in uh, 2018, they purchased from Bayer a major part of its seed business, Monsanto. So oh, so Monsanto, B- okay. yeah. So BASF now owns Monsanto. Um, and they purchased that for seven point six billion with a B euro. Wow. Okay. And they are now the largest chemical producers in the world. Crazy. Right, so, right. So it's like these companies uh, have a huge vested interest in making sure that these chemicals are considered and perceived as safe, right? Um, and as necessary, right? So it's like. Because it's not, you know, and again, it's not necessarily because that they are, but it is because they're making they're making a lot of money because they're able to keep one everyone else out of the market because there's basically there's four of them, and they're making a shit ton. Jake so edit that out. <laughs> a shit ton so of the, money. So the fourth, and really, the, that's that is a huge. That's a huge. You know, that's a huge impetus. So the fourth one, the Pernitas. fourth one. I'm sorry, was Dow Dupont or Dupont. Dow DuPont. Dow DuPont. Okay. So Dow DuPont. the crazy thing with all this, I think like what you're saying mm-hmm. was, or, you know, what, you're, what you were saying originally was this idea about mm-hmm. 
I mean, first off, I think it's kind of funny, right? So we started with, we had no idea what we were doing. We were throwing, you know, we were pushing smoke onto stuff and hoping it would keep the bugs away for whatever damn reason to, mm-hmm. you know, uh, to putting arsenic on stuff. Then Mueller discovers this, you know, this wonder drug and he discovers that in 19, uh, you know, 1930, somewhere around there, 1938, 1935, I think 1940s, 1950s, it comes onto the market in the United States. And then Rachel Carson publishes Silent Spring in the 60s um, after widespread uh, environmental damage occurs. And then there are public hearings and things. So we're going to get into all of it. That leads to the creation of the EPA. But it's only been, you know, 40 years since then. And mm-hmm. I would I would argue that most people don't consider pesticides to be dangerous. Bad? Right? Well- <laughs> It's, again, it's all about marketing. If I say Monsanto, you have a negative association with it. Right. You think right? of a giant killer but plant. If I, yeah. But if I say Syngenta, you're like, I have no idea what that is. Syngenta right? sounds like a wonderful a, a smoothie. Sounds, it does. It sounds like a great smoothie. <laughs> but it, there's, there's so much money put towards making sure that there's this huge buffer between what they actually do and the implications of how they do it and what they're producing and um, and their market audience, right? right? So they've got they pour millions of dollars into lobbyists to make sure that uh, you know the EPA and certain regulations are rolled back and are not in you know are not impinging on their ability to make money. Right. It's it's one of the kind of scary, I think, or the scariest things about kind of modern politics is both mm-hmm. is just the casualness with which bribery has been allowed to kind of go on since like the 1980s, you know, in politics. I mean, it's, Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, we don't call it bribery. We call it lobbying. And then now we call them super PACs, but essentially it's bribery and you have, I mean, you know, and again, this is coming from someone who works in the kind of chemicals industry. It's pretty crazy to think that the people who are, making the economic decisions to like, you know, uh, I don't know, choose a, a smaller pipe size. Cause it's cheaper, even though it's a little bit more risky. They're also the ones deciding, you know, what your kids get to drink. It's kind of, you know, it's not, it's not a great situation. And you'd always, I think for anything you would want an outside observer to be able to come in and say, Hey, this is not cool. And that's really what Rachel Rachel Carson was really the very first of these that's so not kind cool, of you guys. whistleblowers. Yeah. You know, I mean, right. and that's, it's and so not I, cool. And we want, we're not gonna we're gonna take away your money and we're gonna make you stop it. But yeah, yeah, yeah and, and I think it's harder to do. I think there's something to be said though about what you mentioned at kind of the beginning of the discussion of kind of where the modern pesticide industry sits, which was this idea about how much responsibility do we do we expect a company like that to have when you start thinking about, right. right, If you sell somebody, imagine I sell you a poison apple, right. And you bite the apple and it kills you. And then, you know, (laughs) someone else comes along and picks up the apple and bites it and it kills them. And then, you know, if, what if I only intended to kill one person, does that matter? Well, Really? Right. Like, like would I, would I get in trouble for having only killed one person? Cause that was the one person I targeted or, you know, you know, a, a more ridiculous example maybe is, you know, I make a, uh, you know, I make a, I make a poison gas to kill a dictator or something or a smoothie to kill a dictator. And so, you know, it, um, Syngenta smoothie. Yes. They yes. drink it, you know, they drink it and it kills them. But then, you know, their their uh, their spouse drinks it and it kills them, and then the kid drinks it and it kills them. You know, at what point do we? Uh, I don't know why all these people are drinking random smoothies or eating random apples. I've never looked at a half eaten apple and been like, "Oh, it looks good." But you know, like, at what point does collateral damage matter? And at what point do we stop considering? Because that's really what's happening here with a lot of these cases. Is it's going to well, be? Isn't it all collateral damage? Like, if you create, well, so I, I mean, I, I don't want to get into saying about like the gun industry. I mean, but I do think that there's almost there's a parallel to be had with responsibility. What, I think is, what, what is a company's responsibility for for entering a market, creating a product 
and taking that product to market and marketing that product. I think something. you're I think you're right. The difference I think here is that the so if I if I market a chemical and say this chemical is going to be really good at killing, mm-hmm. you know, it's going to be mosquitoes. really great at killing mosquitoes. Yeah. Right. And then if you apply that chemical to your lawn and it does kill the mosquitoes, but then your dog it also kills also, all the bees. Yeah. Uh, right. Or it, it kills your yeah. dog. I think uh-huh. you would you would be angry that I killed your dog, but I don't think legally most people would. You know, if I put a, a warning label on the thing and said, "Hey, this will also kill your dog," that's on you for not being careful with it. Well, but, what what if instead of yeah. it killing your dog, what if like what you're saying, Marie, it kills the mosquitoes, but then it also kills all the bees. And so suddenly right. now all of the flowers in your area are no longer pollinated. Right. 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 And right. it causes it causes catastrophic environmental damage. Who right. who do we consider to be hurt by that? And who do we go to for recourse? But that's yeah, I mean that's well, what the EPA was yes. supposed to be. Right. So the yes. EPA was that was what Rachel yes. Carson was asking was, well, who do we go to re- for to for recourse when it's the government itself? or the chemical companies itself in tandem with the government who are injuring the people and the nature right. of our country that we all own yes. in, um, who yes. do we go to? Yes. Well, and how can you, uh, you know, how can you make a straightforward argument when you have a lot of money that can muddy the waters? And again, this isn't, you know, it sounds sort of conspiratorial, but it's true. It's like these companies have, have, been uh brought up on charges for slandering uh scientists yeah well i mean they right? tried and going they tried after to, and going after people they try to slander they, rachel carson get some. <laughs> exactly so if that hasn't changed i mean they're still doing it now they're doing it with with more money and from almost higher positions of authority and they're still doing it with with a lot of marketing effort as well again and marketing i don't mean you know like commercials like ddt it's for kids but every time you hear about something you don't know what it is right yeah. which is kind of marketing in itself it's 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 making kind of a, a blind it's keeping a blind eye to to something that can do you harm and i think that again like i don't know i go back and forth on this because i agree with you like well i mean the consumer has a certain amount of responsibility in these types of things the company the a corporation's only intent is to make money for its shareholders it has no other and to sell a product and to hold a position in the market it's there's no other responsibility but it has beyond those things um and if you are expecting it to have sort of a social conscience then you're probably gonna be mis you know you're probably gonna be wrong because they just don't that's not what they're that's not what they're that's not what they're you know that's not in their dna i would argue Mm -hmm. Um, which is fine, but you should have some sort of entity that is the impartial third party that can objectively say it's killing bees, (laughs) (laughs) knock it off. We just had, you know, a hive collapse or whatever it is. And it's like, that's, that's an important, and they should be able to understand that and, and, uh, prevent that before it occurs with science and with, with some sort of knowledge. But, as soon as you get enough money, as soon as you get enough vested interest in protecting in protecting corporations, that's what happens with this. Right. And then it becomes harder. Right. And so then the proletariat, they seize the means of production. It's what Damon Marie, I'm mad as hell. I'm not going to take it anymore. Hey, man, we both here. So here's the beautiful thing. We both work for corporations. I don't have <laughs> any beef. Yeah, with business. Same. I have no I have no beef with business. I have absolutely like again, like I just don't think that you should give it the same. Um, you shouldn't. What's the word I'm looking for? Anthropomorphize it. It's not a person. It's not right. It's not something that necessarily is going to act in a rational, compassionate way. Or in no, somebody's in, best interest. In, in fact, it'll almost always act in its own best interest, right? Which exactly is what something it does. that you need to be aware of. <laughs> so, right. and especially when it's about making money. And again, like how they don't go into this thinking, uh, "Hey, we're going to kill as many bees and wipe out the planet as quickly as possible." They're saying we have a product. We will constantly be improving this product. We're bringing it to market at a certain price point, and it'll do X, Y, and Z. And this is what we can prove, but. That doesn't mean that anybody's thought any further 
or given any more credence than that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Dan, guys, so next episode, we're going to get into the early life and uh, the beginnings of Rachel Carson, her beginning quest for an education in science, all of her backstory, the things she went through, and also really the founding of the environmental movement. And and more, yeah. more, I think largely as well, the founding of the biological sciences, really. What's fa- what, one of the things I find fascinating about the story is that it's it's almost a it's almost a David and Goliath story, but it's yeah. also in some ways a story about scientists saying to women, this little part of science we're going to give you, right? We're going to let mm-hmm. you as a stay at home mom, watch birds with your daughters. Oh, so and, cute. You know, and teach, cute you're right. Exactly. Yes. Like, and teach your kids yeah. about trees and crap like that and whatever, while we're off, you know, learning about guns and bombs and stuff. And then, you know, they did learn about it and they got super good at it and smart. And then they, uh, they, they, uh, punched, punched those Ooh, stupid science. Monsanto. In the face. Yep. <laughs> Come on, Marina. It was good for a little bit. All right, dear listeners. Thank you so much for listening to the mad scientist podcast. I am as always your host, Chris Cogswell with my wonderful co-host Marie Mayhew. Power to the people on Power Wednesdays. People. We wear pink. I'm joking. We sure do Marie. All right, dear listeners, thank you so much. This has always been a this has as always been a damn chippy productions. All rights reserved. Thank you again, dear listeners, for listening to the Mad Scientist Podcast. I have been your host, Chris Cogswell, joined by my co-host, Marie Mayhew. If you'd like to contact the show, please send us an email at the Mad Scientist Podcast at gmail.com. That's all one word. You can also follow us on Twitter at Mad Scientist Pod or at Team Giant Squid for Marie. And of course, you can see us on Facebook, on Instagram, and all over the internet as the Mad Scientist Podcast. And again, our logo is the one with the pumpkin head, so it's easy to see. Mm-hmm. If you've enjoyed the show tonight, please consider supporting us on Patreon, where the money that you give to us will help us to promote this show further, to make it better, and just to spend more time making it. Because we love doing that. We do love doing that. Our logo was designed by Carrie Shaheen, our... Web design is done by Desdemona Howard. Woo-hoo. And our sound design is done by Jake Cardinal. Thanks again for listening. <laughs> Thank you. This has been a damn it chippy production.